everybody. I'm Melissa Bonzek, and welcome to episode 54 of Books Cubed, the show where I chat with the authors that you should be reading. It is Thursday, February 20th, 2020, and I'm dying to know what you're reading. So let me know. Drop down to the show notes. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, you will find that first link uh, telling you where to leave comments so that I see them. And if you're on YouTube, you know what to do. Let me know what you're reading. I, I have like, um, I think about 30 books that I have downloaded to my Kindle, some samples, some full books. And uh, I'm going to wander through those this weekend, probably, and pick out three or four things to read. And um, maybe I'll get some of those authors on the show to chat. Uh, if you listened to last week's show, if you haven't listened to last week's show, you need to. I talked to Paige Lavoie. And she has the uh, young adult book and whoops, it's in the other room. I was going to pick it up to show you if you're watching on YouTube and it's called Confessions Diary of an Invisible Girl. And uh, if you leave a comment on last week's show, uh, you will get entered into a drawing and you might win one of uh, Paige's books in e-book e format. I can speak today. So uh, don't forget, take a listen to last week's show. And um, I'll give you instructions on what to do if you want to get entered to possibly win one of her books. Uh, so let's get on to this week's show. If you, uh, we're talking nonfiction today. And if you have epilepsy or you know someone who has epilepsy, then you're going to want to listen to this week's show and possibly forward it to anybody who you know has epilepsy. I am talking to Megan Kennedy, an epilepsy advocate, about the new book that she is part of. And I'm going to look at my notes to make sure I get the title correct. Uh, it's called Visions, the Inspirational Journeys of Epilepsy Advocates. And it's 50 stories. And uh, it's stuff you really want to listen to. And it's, it was just a great show. And it was very informative. And um, there's, there's misconceptions people have about epilepsy. So I talked to Megan about a lot of that. And we hear her story. So uh, let's get right to it. And I will see you afterward. I want to welcome Megan Kennedy. She is here to chat about this new book called Visions, The Inspirational Journeys of Epilepsy Advocates. It's edited by Linda Sadelsky, and I'm going to say these wrong probably, and Stephen Schachter. Correct. Oh, we'll go with that. Yeah. And so these are stories of 50 individuals who are dealing with epilepsy, and Megan is one of them. So welcome, Megan. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Melissa. Oh, I'm so glad you could come on. So tell if you got the book, could you hold it up if you're watching on video? Um, okay, here's the book, Visions, and uh, it's nice. And um, what is that on the cover? I think it's a uh, volcano exploding. <gasps> a volcano exploding, okay. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so tell me uh, how you got involved with this book and, and just a little bit about what the book is. So as it says, Inspirational Journeys of Epilepsy Advocates, there's about 50 stories in here of people either with epilepsy or family members with epilepsy and their journeys. Unfortunately, some of the stories in here do not have, well, they didn't start with happy endings because uh, they lost family members and that's what got them started as an epilepsy advocate and everything. My journey actually started over uh, 33 years ago, um, but, and I'll tell you a little more about that later, but how I got involved was I simply got an email um, from Dr. Schachter one day telling me that he was putting together this book and he was, he had gotten my name. I don't know where from, but he'd gotten my name and was interested in um, learning to, wanted to see if I wanted to be involved with the book and, and share my story about epilepsy. Okay. And what is your story about with epilepsy? So I'm actually over 33 years with epilepsy. I started in college. Um, most people actually think that you're born with it. And yeah, there are people who have it as a child, but um, there's many of us who also who develop it later in life. I know people who didn't develop it until their 50s and stuff. So, but for me, I was 18. And then it took a long time to get control. It actually took 12 years to find what I call the right drug cocktail, um, including going through a clinical trial and everything. And since then, I still have to change things every now and then, but things have been under control for years. In fact, I can't remember the last time I actually had a full-blown um, seizure. Well, that's great. 
yeah, I still have my little auras, my little warning signals on occasion. But as for a full-blown seizure, it's been, like I said, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, and I know I had a roommate in college who had epilepsy, and I know there are so many challenges that mm -hmm. face people. You know, she couldn't drive, and right. uh, I always had to make sure that I watched out for her. So if she was having a seizure, to move things out of the way, um, make sure she wasn't going to hurt herself, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and I know people sometimes have animals, that uh, dogs that help them. Uh, uh, alert them to symptoms. So, question uh, question for you with your with your college roommate. So, what type of seizures did she have? You know, I I don't remember anything what they recall, but she would start rocking back and forth, and her arms would start flying over her head, and she it was almost like she was fighting a demon. Oh wow! Yeah, it I always felt so horrible for her, but I always you know did what I could to keep an eye out for her. I mean, I couldn't follow her all over campus. Uh, but she would have seizures three or four times a week. Yeah, and did she fall on the ground or did she walk around as she was having them? Yeah, no, she would fall okay. down. And so I would, I would make sure to go running over and move anything out of the way. Gotcha. Uh, to, to make sure, get, you know, we, we had, I think there were pillows that would bring over to put around her, uh, that kind of thing. I think we were only roommates for one semester. And I'm not sure she stayed at the school. She might have transferred out because I just remember that one semester. Yeah, she had a thing gotcha. for Elvis for Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> she would play Elvis Presley records all the time. <laughs> there you go. Actually, one of my college roommates uh, introduced me to the Monkees. Oh, nice. They were having their comeback in the '80s with "That Was Then, This Is Now," and that's how I got introduced to the Monkees and everything. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you... all the things you remember. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, what you were telling me there reminds me. First off, it sounds like she has what's known as a tonic clonic seizures, which is what the reason I wanted to bring it up. That's what people typically think of as a seizure, where someone starts shaking, they fall on the ground, or sometimes they go rigid. Um, and the best thing in those cases, like you said, now what they do is you know make sure you turn them on their side, put something under their head so they don't keep hitting their head, make sure there's nothing around. Um, if you don't know they have a history of epilepsy, call 911, of course. Um, or if the seizures continue or last longer than five minutes is what they say, um, because there could be something else going on. But if you don't know they have that history of seizures or if they're pregnant or have diabetes, because a lot of people can have seizures for other reasons. The other thing that came to mind when you mentioned your college roommate was one of my college roommates, um, Marla, we made a great pair because she has diabetes and I have epilepsy. <laughs> and um, whenever her blood sugar was low, she was actually prone to having a seizure. So my fir the first seizure I actually witnessed was what was known as a non-epileptic seizure because it was her, her blood sugar was low. Of course, I freaked out because I was always the one having the seizures, didn't know what to do at that time. I was still addicted to everything, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why I said there could be times where people are having seizures for other reasons and you don't know what's going on. And that's why you need to call 911, especially if you don't know what's going on. So, yeah, yeah but um, I have what's a different type of seizure. There's, there's multiple types of seizures out there. Um, but the tonic-clonic, people might be more familiar with the phrase grand mal, but they've, they've changed the terms. In fact, I know they just changed them a couple of years ago. And I'm, I'm sorry, the name, the new, the new nerd name is eluding me at this time. <laughs> memory, you remember what you said about the side effects while memory issues is one of those issues I deal with with my epilepsy. So I'm, I'm blaming it on the meds right now. Well, you'll <laughs> wake up at midnight and you'll remember. <laughs> Just I know, don't, don't I know. Me. It's something called kind of generalized tonic, clonic seizures, something like that, but I can't remember the exact phrase. Um, but mine were known as complex partial. And now they're, uh, what is it? I think they're partial seizures with impaired awareness or, okay, again, again like I said, I, I, I don't remember the, the full terminology. That I'm still getting used to the new terminology, but they used to be known as complex partial seizures. So what I would do is I could be sitting at my desk, I could be walking around the college campus, um, and I would do what my dad called my third base coach routine because I would make really weird hand gestures oh. with my hands, but I would be mumbling um, I would not be alert, but I'd be walk. I'd be able to walk. I wouldn't be on the ground, or if I was sitting, I would just be staying there. You know, stay there seated, and make those weird hand gestures, mumble, and no one knew the better. Most of the, t I've actually had times at work where 
I had a seizure at my desk and no one knew I had a seizure. That's how, um, in other words, they're, they're you know, incognito, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is that typical then of that type? We have company. <laughs> They'll all look like they're doing baseball still. No, they, people have different things. They could be picking at their clothes, smacking their lips. Everyone has different things that they do. Um, and then there are the people who have, like you said, the tonic clonic seizures where they fall on the ground, but that's what people typically think of that when they think of a seizure, they don't think of the other types of seizures. Yeah. Um, there's also absence seizures. And again, terminology has changed and they flicker, they flicker their, their eyelids and, um, they look like they might be daydreaming and yes, those tend to be more indicative. Yes, that might be more indicative in children. Yeah. Yep. He had that he, in college also. And uh, yeah, he couldn't drive either. And, and he would just be sitting there and all of a sudden he would just space out for a moment and then he'd come back and go, was I spaced out? I probably just had a seizure. Like, oh yeah, you were. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And it didn't seem, it didn't seem like it was um, painful. They didn't last very long. Thank goodness. Um, but I, I'm sure it would be um, uh, frightening to yeah. all of a sudden, especially if you're on a bus or uh, walking down an escalator or something, you know, and all of a sudden this happens and then you come to and you're trying to figure out where you are. Well, how about this? You're talking about walking down things. One time I had a seizure. It was actually on a Valentine's Day and I was, it was in Colorado. I was in my apartment. It was a cold, rainy night and I was in my apartment about to go to bed. The last thing I remember is I was walking into my room to change into my pajamas. And the next thing I know is I'm, I'm waking up outside. Yes. So I'm wow. in, in the dark. I've walked down a flight of stairs. I can't get into my apartment building. The, I have no shoes on and the, the wet, the, it's all wet and rainy and cold for the ground. Oh geez. What did you do? I had walked down. I had had a seizure and I somehow was able to walk down the stairs without falling down the stairs. How'd you get back in your apartment? Well, at first I kept trying to open the door because after a seizure, I, they have what's called a post-ictal state is what it's referred to. And when you're post-ictal, you're think of, you know, like here they have the volcano exploding. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know I've used the phrase, you know, your brain's just had a thunderstorm going through it. So basically your brain is having to recover. So when, you, when you're post-ictal, you're a little, you're more aware of what's going on around you, but I still wouldn't be able to communicate. So I, I, I knew, I knew the door was there. I kept trying to open the door. I knew how to open a door, but I had no key with me. I didn't think about the fact that the door was locked. Um, I was at the back door of the complex. So there was no button for the manager. Oh. So eventually I thought about, oh, I need to get a hold of the manager, but there was no button there. So I started to walk around towards the front. But by that point, I'd been standing outside so long that my feet were so cold and I started having that little knife feeling. I did get minor frostbite on my feet that time. So I went back by the door where it wasn't as wet. And w later on, uh, you know, maybe five or 10 minutes later, someone came in and then I just walked on in. I went back upstairs. My, my apartment door was wide open. Wow. So luckily nothing had been taken either, but I will, I, you know, at the time you're totally freaked out, but Later on, I actually was thinking, oh, I wonder, I, I, I actually was, you know, you laugh about it later. And I also said, well, I'm sort of lucky that it happened when it did, because if it had happened maybe a minute later, I would have been outside naked. Oh, God. Because they can remember yeah, I said I was going to change for my pajamas. <laughs> oh, God. You know, um, did you think about maybe always wearing a key around your neck or something like that? No. And then, well, but the other part of that story is I said, well, if I had been naked, I probably would have gotten in sooner because someone would have called 911 with this naked lady outside, you know? <laughs> probably. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that was over 20 years ago, actually over 25 years ago that that actual incident happened. But so, yeah, it is something that you have to deal with on a daily basis and some people more than others. At my worst, I was having six to eight seizures a month, but there's people who have hundreds of seizures a day. Um, what you mentioned about a key. I never wore a key, but I did wear um, an alert bracelet. Oh, good. You know, I did. I don't wear it now for various reasons. One is, you know, things are controlled. 
Um, but people, I do let people at work know about it. My husband knows about it. My friends know about it. So if you have epilepsy, don't be afraid to talk about it. Um, you can wear, like you said, the medical alert bracelet or the one that goes around your, your neck or put a, a card in your, your wallet, just different things. But the people that you're around with all the time, just make sure and talk to them about it and let them know if I have a seizure, this is what you can expect to see, but also let them know what you want them to do. Yeah. You know, do you want them to call 911? Do they want you to, you know, I tell people just let me sit there, stay with me, talk to me unless this happens, you know, kind of thing, then call 911. Because for me, by the time 911, you know, emergency would get there, the seizure would be over and they could be out helping someone else. But for some people, they do need that, that help. So, cause everyone's case is different. So, but I stopped wearing it cause things are under control, but also being that I work in, in libraries and I, I actually, uh, I got tired of people coming up and saying, what's wrong with you? Oh, <laughs> when there's yeah. nothing wrong with me. <laughs> well, yeah, there is, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, people have no filters. They will say to you, they'll, you know, cause I, I was deaf for like 25 years. I wear cochlear implants now, but yeah, people, they have no filters and they want to know all about what's going on and, and, oh my God, what's it like for you? And, and I have magnets underneath my scalp okay. that hold my implants on and they, I'll say to people, would you like to touch, you know, there's bumps under there. You can feel where the magnets are. Yeah. But, but yeah, people, they, people want to know, they always, they will always ask questions and sometimes it's, yeah, sometimes it's not um, polite questions. Right. Yeah. And I don't have a problem talking about it, but still it was at a point where it's like, okay, I need to do my work. And <laughs> yeah. Well, I would imagine the bracelet would be noisy too. You know, it, bumping against counters and, and against books maybe. And yeah, sometimes you know, it did. You're right. Yeah. You always expect the vibrating to be shushing everybody. And then she's got all this jewelry that makes all this noise. <laughs> so. So Although you, libraries aren't necessarily shushing places like they used to be. So, hey, oh, well, that's good. libraries have changed. <laughs> you know, they have. They have. I, um, I get most of my library books. I use an app. I forget what it's called. I, I have to look it up again. But I use an app to get most of my library books now where I don't even have to go into the library. And my card is hooked into the app. Oh, oh wow. wow. Let me see. I'm going to look it up just because I'm mentioning it. If you like to, it's called Libby, L-I-B-B-Y. Okay. So it's an app you can download. And if you like to go to the library and there's never parking at the library, it's a really s small parking lot. So it's just easier for me to go onto Libby and type in what I want. My library card is already hooked and I can get audiobooks or whatever eBooks they have. I just can't mm -hmm. get, you know, paper books, but I read a lot of eBooks. So there you go. Audiobook, and I love audiobooks. So uh, it's, it's a really great app. So anyway, yeah. so if I'm old fashioned though, I still prefer to, I still prefer to have the book in hand. I'm old fashioned. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, I do. I always have at least one paper book that I'm reading and I have one or two eBooks that I'm reading. And then I have at least one audio book I'm listening to because depending on where I am, you know, what time of day and where I am depends on, on, um, what I'm, I'm doing at night. I can't listen to audio books cause I'll fall asleep and it'll keep going and I take my implants <laughs> off. So and I'm completely, completely deaf when I take them off. So my husband listens to the TV all night long and I never hear it. So it's no problem. I, I remember, I remember, I remember trying audiobooks in the car on my way to my parents' house. And I was like, this book is not making any sense. And I was like, didn't they talk about that like three chapters ago kind of thing? And then I realized that I had had a CD in and had it on shuffle. So when I put the audio book in on, sh on, it kept it on shuffle. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so I was like, oops, okay. Had to start that book over again. <laughs> oh, I never thought about that problem. Oh, that's funny. Now you've been involved yeah. with epilepsy advocacy for a long time, right? Right. Mm -hmm. In a sense, I feel like I've been involved almost since the beginning. And... I remember back in college, one of the first things, maybe not the first, but one of my first advocacy um, things I did was when I was in speech class and we had to do a short speech on something. So of course, since I was still learning about epilepsy, I picked epilepsy. 
I know it wasn't my first year, the same year I was diagnosed with epilepsy a couple years later, but I did a short speech on epilepsy. And this is one of those things I still remember. Um, whenever we did a speech in that class, my teacher, she would always, um, she had her little sheet and would review you, but you also had two peer reviewers, but you didn't know who was reviewing you. She would hand them out throughout the class. And so you didn't know who was reviewing you. One of the ones that I got back um, was, thank you, I have epilepsy, had a little note on there, thank you for talking, I have epilepsy too. Oh, nice. So you were able to reach somebody. Yeah. Right. But they never came out and talked to me about it. So I was all, I was like in the, what? That's too bad that they didn't. Yeah. So I had no idea who it was. I'm assuming it was a, a lady based on the, the handwriting, but, um, you know, like I said, that's an assumption, which is not a tr necessarily a truth, but I do remember, you know, in the beginning I did have a good support group because I had my family, my mom's a nurse, you know, she had an uncle who was a doctor. So we got a good neurologist right away, you know, just various things like that. But as for, you know, my friends supported me and everything, but as for having people to talk to about it, who understood it, I wish they had come forth to me because then we maybe could have helped each other out and talked more about how we each felt about it. Cause it wasn't for years probably a good five or six years before I got involved with an actual epilepsy um, organization. The first one, it was called Epilepsy Inc. When I was out of college and I was back in Colorado, there was a local organization called Epilepsy Inc. And they would do outreach, you know, mostly getting information to people with epilepsy, you know, things like that. And, um, but that was when I first started talking to people about epilepsy who had epilepsy or, or knew people with epilepsy was at that point. And later on, then I got, to, you know, so over the years, things uh, progressed. When I moved out to California, I looked for a local organization. Um, the lo closest one at the time was the Epilepsy Foundations, both in LA and San Diego. And for those unfamiliar with the uh, LA, with the uh, Southern California, that's a good hour to an hour and a half drive without the traffic. <laughs> So at the time I had no license. I actually went almost uh, about nine years without a license. So I would get around, you know, bike, bus, carpool, walk. And, you know, when I moved into out here, I started using Metro a couple of times, but never got to use it completely. But that is an option. And now today people have Lyft or Uber, things like that, that can help them get around as well. So, yes. so, but bike, bus, carpool, walk, that was my, my mantra for, for, for transportation. But because of the distance, it was hard for me to get to any of those events. And especially since I didn't drive, but once I did start to drive, I started going to their events, started volunteering with them, started making connections there, um, got involved with um, the Epilepsy Foundation of San Diego one of the gentlemen I met at another conference, Adrian, he introduced me to the people at the San Diego chapter, and they had an advocate program going called Hope, Help Other People with Epilepsy. Um, and I started with that program. So I was at home and doing presentations up where I lived instead of being down in San Diego. So that helped me out. But every time I did something, I kept wanting to do more. And so eventually, and the reason I was working with those organizations is they were the closest chapters to where I was at. It turned out that the area that I live in, Riverside County, when you put in the zip code on the Epilepsy Foundation site, I got a little note saying, you know, sorry, we don't have, I forget exactly what it said, but it was basically that they didn't have an organization in this area and they wanted me to call the DC chapter, which was the national chapter. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> Over time, so that's how I got involved with those ones because they were the closest. But eventually, I kept wanting to do more and more. And because of the fact that I knew I couldn't make it to those events, and I kept meeting people on occasion at, at their events who had made it out from the Inland Empire where I live now. So eventually, I got to the point where it was time to start a local organization and took the time, did a business, business plan, took some classes through a program called the Inland Empire Women's Business Center. And um, they had a program called It's Your Time. Um, and it was you know, a program for women to go through 
a set of business classes in which you write a business plan, it gets graded. And my plan for epilepsy education ever happened to be the winning business plan. So I ended up getting a business, a package that part of it included all, all basically it all included stuff that helped me get the business started, including some time with a lawyer to get all the paperwork done to get the nonprofit started. <laughs> Nice. So everything just sort of fell into place, you know. <laughs> nice. So how many people are, are involved now with this with this chapter that you started? Right now, uh, it, it 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 ebbs and flows. Um, I ended up personally. I had a uh, some illness last year, and as well as a wedding. <laughs> That's right. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you, thank you. So we did sort of have to take time off, but the board, we're, we're revamping things and we're getting those organization um, programs going again and everything. And sorry, I'm waving hi to my husband. That's what you saw, right? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> hey, Frank. Now I, was, I suddenly smelled heat and I looked over at my lamp to make sure it wasn't in fire. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, we don't want that. We don't want no. that. Oh, so, yes. <laughs> but right now we... Uh, more recently, the mo we've been helping people most through through Facebook, through online, you know, re responding to messages, sending them information they want, links that they need, um, responding to phone calls. Um, we are working on getting pro more programs going on, you know, not on site, but locally. You yeah. know, we're looking at getting, um, especially, you know, want to get, you know, people to know about visions. We want to let people know about some of the new um, things that are out there. I know, especially when the board and I were talking just last week, uh, some of the workshop ideas we were talking about were uh, getting a program going so that parents who have kids with epilepsy can, um, what's the word again? So that when they turn 18, the parents can still be in control. I forget, I just spaced the name of it right now. Um, sorry, memory, okay, blame it on the memory but also um, inform people about things like CBD or the VNS and the RNS. Those are all options for treatment with epilepsy um, that aren't medication related and everything. So there's a lot of new things out there. Things have come a long way since I started with epilepsy. When I first started, there was about 10 medications on the market, brain surgery, and the ketogenic diet was just starting to come back to the surface. Um, but now you have the ketogenic diet, the VNS, the RNS. You have um, about 20, what is it, 26 meds on the market, over 26 meds that are now approved on the market. And is it, is it, and, is it um, diet? There's, An epilepsy diet? Yeah, you keto, say? yeah. So the ketogenic diet, and there's actually some variations of that too. Um, but the ketogenic diet, so it's a, it was actually my first. Um, affiliation with it was when I was doing some research. They did research on it in the 20s at the Mayo Clinic. Oh. Yeah. And, but from my understanding is that it actually dates further back than that. But um, that's my first affiliation with it and all that. But uh, there's a, an organization called the Charlie Foundation and their story about the ketogenic diet and how it helped their son. They were the ones that um, got it started again back in the 90s and brought it back to attention to the doctors and it helped their son out and after they had their their son had the diet i believe it was for two years um but you can read their story in, in the book and everything nice. but he he's now seizure free since then so wow. but it works for some people and not for others but then there's variations of it initially i thought it was only for kids but it's not it's for kids or adults but it is a very restrictive diet. Um, you know, it's a high fat, low carb diet is what it is. And so I remember when I first heard about it, I heard about people eating globs of peanut butter and stuff, but of course they've changed it much more so now and made it a lot more friendly, but it still is very restrictive and you have to weigh everything. Wow. But, um, and just like medication, it can have side effects too. So you do have to do that under the care of a doctor and, and a nutritionist and everything. But there's the MCT oil diet and um, there's a couple others. And then they do, um, 
like I said, unfortunately, those names are eluding me right now, but I know there's a few other um, dietary variations of that, but the keto is is it was one that was like i said originally researched by the mayo clinic back in the 20s as a treatment for epilepsy and how do you spell that k-e-t-o-g-e-n-i-c okay i'll have you send it to me in a me message <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> okay so can you read a little bit from your story in the book for everybody oh yeah sure so don't read the whole thing because they'll have to buy the book to get it but I know, I know. We want them a to little read, snippet or a little bit. Read, read a section. So yeah. I know. So um, I've got a couple different sections. So let me read this first part here, just because it explains more about the beginning of me with epilepsy. It was fall of 1986. I was in my dorm room at Marquette talking to my childhood best friend who was in college in Virginia. During our conversation, I suddenly wasn't able to talk. About 20 minutes later, I was finally able to speak with her again. She had stayed on the phone the whole time, talking to me and worried about me. She told me I'd been mumbling a lot. She made me promise to go see the doctor the next day as I had no idea what had happened. That phone call was the start of what has now been a 33 year old journey with epilepsy. Oh. So, I, I, so as I, I, th I don't know if I would have gotten to another phone and called 911 or what, I mean, I've been, I'm surprised. Well, it's, it's tough. You don't know what the person, what's, what, what's going on on the other end of the phone. So I'm glad she stayed on the phone with you though. Right. And, and as I tell people when we're, you know, when I'm mentioning that story is, well, she stayed on the phone with me, but guess what? That's back when we had to pay minute by minute. Oh, that's right. And, and we were still attached to the phone to the wall. <laughs> uh, well, good. So that was a rather you. lengthy phone call for us. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and even though it was about 20 minutes before I could talk to her, it was only, um, sorry, <clears throat> um, the seizures themselves only last, you know, seconds to maybe a minute or so for me. Yeah. You know, but again, that varies for everyone. But it's that postictal state where, you know, you're unaware of things and you can't communicate. And sometimes I'll say something and I'll be like, okay, I just said something. I know I was going to say something, but I can't remember what I was about to say or what I just said, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's... Your brain's still trying, your brain is trying to get back on track, basically, and everything. So that's not, not fun. But yeah, that was the start of my journey. And as I said before, I was lucky because my mom's a nurse, you know, she had an uncle who was a doctor. And so we were able to get me into a really good neurologist. And so I'm having to call my parents from college. So I'm a thousand miles away from my parents having to call them and tell them that, oh, they think I, something's wrong. I need to go see a neurologist. <laughs> you know, so you can only imagine what was going on through my parents' minds a thousand miles away. So, and then um, my, I had an aunt of mine who actually drove me to that um, doctor appointment. You know, later on, once I knew where to go, I took the bus. But the first time, you know, I had an aunt who drove me, you know. Oh, nice. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot to it. But like I said, I, I, had that, I had that support, but it was years before I started meeting with people with epilepsy who I could talk to about what it was like for them and really get a better understanding of how everyone's story is different. Yeah. You know, there's similarities, but differences, you know. Yeah, well, that's good that the advocacy, advocacy, I can speak, groups are there because it's very isolating when you have something wrong with you and you can't talk to other people about it. Mm hmm Right. Well, and the thing is, there are a lot of adv advocacy groups out there. There's especially a lot on Facebook, but I feel it's always better when you can talk to someone one-on-one -on -one because you just never know, you know, when you're talk trying to talk, do a message online, sometimes you know, things don't quite come across the way you mean. I know even when you text people, you're like, what did you mean by that? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 And sarcasm just doesn't work um, on, on texting. <laughs> true. True. Yeah. The, the, that, that tone and sarcasm doesn't come across. <laughs> so, but if we have time, I had another section I wanted oh, yeah, to. Oh yeah, please. So, okay. Whoops. Hold on. 
So to give a, um, before I read this part, like I said, I used to have about six to eight seizures a month. So, and as I mentioned back when I started, there was only about 10 medications on the market. And I got to a point where I'd been through almost all of them. But there was one that I, ref one I did not go on and I refused to go on it only because there was a lot of horror stories going on about it. Oh. So I just was like, no, I'm not trying that one. I'm not even going to risk that, you know, because I had had a lot of weird side effects, you know, over the years. But um, here we go. Here's a section I was going to read. It was the early 90s and nothing was working. I was having problems and basically out of medication to try. By this time, my license had been taken away. I had stopped having my auras. I drove home crying after that doctor's visit, but got up the next day, hopped on my bike and rode to work. I was thinking about seeing if I was a candidate for brain surgery, but my doctor wanted me to do a clinical trial. Both my mom and my doctor were actually encouraging me to do that clinical trial. There was only one reason that I refused to do so, because I didn't want to be on a medication that wasn't approved by the Food and Drug Administration. I kept going through my days, having about six to eight seizures a month without a license. My quality of life was declining and my options were low. I was scared to be by myself, and I was so scared that I asked my parents if I could move in with them. They said no, which shocked me at the time, but later I realized they wanted me to maintain my independence. I don't remember exactly what happened, but one day I had an epiphany. A light bulb went off that got me over the clinical trial hump. I suddenly realized that no matter what medication I went on, it was an experiment for me because my body was different than everyone else's. People are allergic to other pre-approved drugs or even common foods like peanut butter or strawberries. I decided to do the clinical trial and if it didn't work, then I'd see if I was a surgical candidate. Now, is this the one that worked for you? This one did work for me. Is this, yeah. this one you're still on? I'm not on this one now. It worked for me, but, um, and, as, and as I mentioned in there, I said it did work for me, but Back then, um, usually I'd be on a medication for about two to two and a half years. And that is if it works. Some, some meds I was off after a month, I, I got off of them. You know, one, I remember one medication, I, all I could do was sleep. You know, you know it, it got me so groggy. I would, every time I could, I would sleep. So after a month, I told the doctor, take me off of this, you know. Yeah. But um, no, this particular medication I was on, and after about two to ha two and a half years, I started having seizures again. Oh. And usually after that two to two and a half years, then it's like, okay, we got to get you off of this and get you on something else. And so, but um, I went through the trial. Um, I And when you're doing a trial like this one, it was one of those double pl blind placebo trials. So I don't know if I, you know, you don't know if you're going to get the placebo or you don't know if you're going to get the medication. I'm assuming I got the medication because everything worked, you know? Ah. <laughs> so I'm assuming I got the medication. Um, I'm also assuming that, you know, and the, and the thing is that because when the, I finished the trial, it wasn't approved yet, I was able to stay on the medication and um, still see those doctors there. But after a while, like I said, it got to the point where I did have to switch like all my prior medications. Um, but what happened, the reason I didn't consider brain surgery at that point was that the, um, during that time frame was when they had the second generation of anti-epileptic drugs started coming out. So there were new medications on the market. And ever since then, there's been new medications. We're now into the third generation of anti-epileptic drugs. So since there were new options, I started trying those. And those. And the other thing was, and the reason I wanted to read this story about the clinical trial is they are always looking for people, you know, not just with epilepsy, but with other disorders and for trials. And it, sometimes the trial can be someone who's on, on medication and it's, you know, you're, you're under control, but they have something they need to test. And there's always people, doctors out there looking for these uh, for people to be on trials, they need help. Um, I know the Epilepsy Foundation has a site. We we always are putting links up about it to remind people. Um, go through the CDC clinicaltrials.gov site and look and see if there's something in your area that you know if you're if you're having issues and see if there's something in your area. If it doesn't work for you, guess what? No matter what, you're helping the doctors out and you're helping other people out. I actually 
this was sort of one of those, I remember, like I said, I had that issue getting into it because I said, oh, this isn't approved. Who knows what's going to happen? But then like all the other medications, I didn't know what was going to happen until I got on them. Yeah. yeah. So and I always want to encourage, I want to encourage people is like, don't let it stop you just because it's a clinical trial. You don't know what's going to happen. But again, with everything else, you don't know what's going to happen. So, and this was something that I wasn't expecting. Years later, um, I happened to be at a, you know, one of those small craft parties at a friend's house and found out that she was actually taking that medication. But she wasn't taking it for epilepsy. She was taking it for migraines. Interesting. And so later on, after it was diagnosed for epilepsy, then they transitioned it for migraines as well. And I thought, and I just sort of had one of those little like, oh, wow, I helped make a difference in her life. So it was one of those unexpected thoughts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this was, oh, wow. That was a good 15 years later. Yeah. And, you know, I wonder had the, if they had the idea that it might help with migraines or if that was just along the way as they were testing it, people noticed that their migraines went away too. Right. Yeah. I don't know. So, but the thing is, so it made me realize that, wow, I did make a people, a, a difference in people's lives. So even if you go on a trial and it doesn't work for you, no matter what, you're helping the doctors out and you're helping out future generations. That's what you're doing. Yeah. So I do yeah. encourage people to, you know, to give the, give those, give those trials an option, especially if nothing else is working for you. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you never know what's going to work for you. Like you said, everyone's body is different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the book now, the um, it's on sale. We don't know how long it's going to be on sale. It's thirty percent off right now on the website of the publisher. Oxford. Yeah, the Oxford University Press. Oxford this University. Is so we will have the links in the show notes. I think it's normally forty nine ninety five. Correct. And so it's so the, the, as you said, there is um, Oxford University Press. Oxford University Press is currently doing a promo so that um, you can get thirty percent off. So that drops it from. I'm just going to say fifty dollars. It's easier. <laughs> Yeah, down to fifty to thirty four ninety seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, but thirty five and fifty is so much easier to say. You know, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So, um, we'll have the code in the show notes. If you just drop down uh, to, if you're listening on the podcast, after you've pulled over to the side of the road, uh, look at the link, uh, first link in the show notes, and if you're on YouTube, uh, you know how to find links. They'll be right down there. So, um, yeah. And we I'm don't just like not sure to... how long it's going to be. So uh, today, this will air on uh, February twentieth, twenty twenty. So uh, look for the book right away if you're interested in getting it. And you know, if it's later and it's off sale, it's a good book. It's lots of great stories, fifty stories of people who are dealing with epilepsy, and it may be something you may read something that could help you, or help someone you know, or someone you know exactly, exactly. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Oh, I see you're wearing purple, and purple of is course. the epilepsy color. I had to throw my purple on today. So whenever I'm out there doing a presentation, which is something else that we do with epilepsy education everywhere, we're out to health fairs, presentations, things like that. So there's a lot that a lot that we do. Um, but yeah, so to note, last Monday, uh, February 10th, was International Epilepsy Day. So the second Monday of each February, so mark your calendars ahead for next year, um, International Epilepsy Day. Uh, coming up in March, on March 26th is Purple Day. And the story behind Purple Day is in the book as well, the people who got that started. And then um, November here in the United States is Epilepsy Awareness Month. And I know people sometimes ask me, well, why is Purple Day in March and November is Epilepsy Awareness Month? So one quick tidbit is the person who got epilepsy, uh, Purple Day started um, lives in Canada. And there they have March as their Epilepsy Awareness Month. So you have to remember, epilepsy is worldwide, not just here in the United States. In fact, there's over 65 million people worldwide and one in 26 people who are going to develop epilepsy in their lives. So there's a good chance that as, every day as you're out there, you're walking by someone with epilepsy or who knows someone with epilepsy. Yeah. Statistic. Yeah. Pretty crazy, huh? 
do they think that is it just in the is is it in environmental things that that have made more people or is it just because there's more people you're gonna have more that are gonna have epilepsy is it just something that there as for environmental it, it again everyone's different um years ago they used to think it was genetic and in fact um if you look at a supreme court case buck v bell um there used to actually be epilepsy colonies here in the united states and at one of them they they started uh, for enforcing people to be sterilized if they had epilepsy and throughout the u.s as part of the eugenics movement um there actually are a number of states who if you had epilepsy you were either denied the right of marriage or um you were forced to be sterilized so that you couldn't have kids because they thought it was genetic and it's not to say that it's not genetic it can be genetic in some cases but me for example i have over 100 known relatives just on um on one side of the family i have over 100 known relatives and no one else has epilepsy on either side of the family just me so um yes, and, and i've for for transparency megan's my cousin yes the union is huge they take over a girl scout camp every other fourth of july it's crazy there are so yes. many of them. <laughs> so, so many of them <laughs> And that's just the ones that are able to make it that year. So, hey, yeah. but um, yeah, no. So we, uh, yeah, like I said, we have, we have a blast at those reunions. Trust me. So, hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is Camp Susan's Lake back? What? The lake was gone for a long time. Is the lake back? Oh, it was flooded this last time. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's great. Because there was one year that we went and there was no lake. Like, oh my God, the lake's gone. Well, the lake's always been there. It was just smaller, <laughs> which meant the island in the middle was bigger. This time the island wasn't there. You could see the tree, but not the island. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. I'm glad the water's back though. Yes, definitely, definitely. So, but like I said, with our family, there's no one else in the family with, with epilepsy. So in our, in my case, it's not genetic, but in some cases it can be genetic. It can be due to birth trauma, maybe, um, you had some other brain, you know, head injury that caused it. And that's why people can develop it at any stage in their life. Um, things like encephalitis, meningitis. Um, there's a number of reasons. But in reality, only about, let's see, they say about 70% of people do not know why. Wow. It's known as idiopathic. So I'm in that idiopathic um, group where we don't know why I have it. We can't trace it back to something. So m most people don't know why. And they're always learning more. And they're doing, especially with all the new gene research doing, they're always doing more research and everything. So the, I'm sure that, that those statistics are going to change as time goes on. But, um, but yeah, for now, like I said, those are just a handful of reasons people could, can develop epilepsy. Okay, we'll hold up the book one more time. So anybody okay. who is watching on the video, it is called Visions, The Inspirational Journeys of Epilepsy Advocates. There's 50 stories. It is $50 a dollar a story, which is a good price. And there you go. it is That's on good sale for 30% yeah. off. So if you are wanting to get the book for yourself or someone you know who has epilepsy, uh, this is the time to jump on the website for the uh, publisher for Oxford Press, and we will have the link in the show notes. And thank you for coming on today. And the cats sort of walk through. I, I know that was precious. Cat, but no, but nobody stayed. Nobody stuck their nose in the camera. Ah, uh, silly kitties. Uh, oh, well. Oh, well. Next time. Maybe. Yeah, maybe next time. Maybe next <laughs> time. All right. Thanks so much for being here today, Megan. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Bye bye. Thanks, Megan. Can't wait to see you at the next family reunion. If you would like to get a copy of uh, Visions, The Inspirational Journeys of Epilepsy Advocates, it is on sale for 30% off. So uh, I wouldn't wait too long because I don't know how long the sale is going to last. But I will have a link in the show notes. Uh, this is February 20th, 2020. So if you're listening in real time and you are interested, I would jump on that link and go right to it. The book is $49.99 or $95. You get it for 30% 30, 30 off. So that's a good deal. The promo code is A as in Apple, M as in Mary, P as in Paul, R as in Romeo, O as in Oreo. 
M is in medical, D is in doctor, the number nine. So I will have that in the show links also. Uh, just click that link. It will take you right to the book on Oxford Press and then put in that, show, put in that um, promo code and you will get your 30% off as long as you do it soon. If you're hearing this ages from now, go ahead and try it anyway. Who knows? Maybe it'll still work. And uh, that's it for today. And uh, I don't know it's going to be uh, for next week. Uh, I have some options. I just don't know which show I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with yet. I haven't even thought about it. I've been finishing the next book in my June Nash Misadventure series. Uh, I'm very excited. I'm waiting on the cover. Uh, I'll have something in like I think it's like seven days, something like that. So I'm very excited to see uh, what that's going to look like. And uh, I'm just finishing the edits. So uh, once the edits are done, it goes back to the editor and she takes a look at everything. And then it goes on to uh, the people who are going to do reviews for me. I've got about 10 people lined up. And then it's uh, going to go to my final eyes to look for any errors, um, uh, you know, Oh, instead of ow, <laughs> that one almost slipped through one time, O-W-E instead of O-W, that kind of thing. So uh, that's what I'm at right now. And I think the book, fingers crossed, I was hoping it would be out on March 1st. It is called How to Square Your Grouper. Uh, I don't think it's going to make March 1st because I think the cover won't be done yet. But I should be able to make March 15th. The cover should be done I should have everybody lined up for reviews. I should have all of the final eyes uh, have been able to have time to go through it. Uh, and then um, I'm on to book three, of which I already have about 40 pages written. So I am really, really excited about book three. I'm excited about book two. Uh, I'm excited about book one. If you want to go back and read it, I'll have links in the show notes. Uh, so anyway, uh, you guys go back, uh, go out there and go read a good book and uh, I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.